Time to set the record straight on fructose relative to uric acid, gout, Alzheimer's, etc. Let's get started. Well, welcome to our garden in Eastern Carolina in the early part of, I don't know if we can call it the fall, but it's uh, mid-September and it is the first really, really, really nice day. It's no humidity, the sun is out, it's about to set in a couple hours. And um, I wanted to cover a couple of things, but it's just a splendid day to be outside, it really is. Here's our garden. We've had certain successes and certain failures, and I'll get to that later. What I wanted to talk about today was, you know, there's kind of a controversy within uric acid. Uric acid is this buzzword. It's obviously connected with gout, very much connected with the gout. And I wanted to simplify it so it didn't have to be all diagrammatic and molecular biochemistry and everything else. Um, there are some basic things that cause it that you really need to know about it, because if you know what causes it, you can avoid these things. So let me start from the top. You need to know about what your uric acid levels are, and you can do that in a couple of ways. You can do that by simply going to a lab and getting a lab test called uric acid. Pretty straightforward. And if you want to do it that way, there's a link in the description of this video that I get nothing out of through um, Ulta Labs, which works with Quest, and you can find out what it costs and go to the one nearest you, and it's probably going to be 10 or 20 bucks, someplace in there. So that's one way you can do it. Another way you can do it by meters. And I think meters are good because you're doing it at home and you're doing it as frequently as you want to do it, but it's just like a glucometer like diabetics use for their blood sugar. And so you can do it once a day exactly at the same time. So you have day after day after day continuing, you know, comparing to each other. And that's what labs are about. That's why you always go for a fasting lab for the most part, for most labs. So they're comparable labs. Um, but the reason the meter I think is better is because you get to learn about yourself, not just what is my uric acid when I'm fasting relative to glucose, relative to cholesterol, relative to ketones, all those are good. But what happens when you're fasting? Like we're in a three day fast right now and we're, gonna, we're, we're documenting that for a future video. What about after a meal? You need to know how uric acid, the level is, changes in your life. You really do. Once you know this, it's usable information for the rest of your life. So this is how you measure the uric acid. There's really just two ways. One is you can go to get a standard lab done, and that's fine, but it should be fasting and it should be in the context of all your other labs. That's often a little bit too much work for most people, but I wanna show you what that is. Should you go and you get your labs done and get uric acid, you'll find out that's me and that's Judy. I'm a lot higher than hers. Think I got a problem? We'll talk. But what I want to show you is here it says the range is 3.8 to 8.4. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It is not 3.8 to 8.4. I'm basically too high for a healthy range. And that's the problem. We have to back away from these conventional brackets, say, hey, you're doing just fine, buddy, or ma'am, or whoever. It really should be a lot less than that. For me, it should be under, ideally, five and a half would be great. Five and a half or even four it should be something I should shoot for. So you have meter or blood work. This is the meter we use, and I'll show you that in just a second. Here's what that looks like, and should you be interested, there's a link on the description to this very video for that big discount as well. This is what we use, and we use it because we have the ability to measure glucose, cholesterol, ketones, and uric acid. And boy, this has been interesting. We just had a four-day fast, and to measure these, fasting every morning was very helpful to learn about uric acid and what happens relative to glucose and so on and so forth. So that's the how. Now you take this thing, if you find that you have elevated out of range, for a woman that's over six is the number, milligrams or deciliter, and a man that's seven. All right, so if you're above that, they call it hyperuricemia, elevated, uh, elevated uric acid. That doesn't mean it's a problem, but it could be a problem. And if you're one that actually does have gout, that it really does have your big toe or your knee or your wrist or something else, then you need to take this a little more seriously. If nothing bothers you, then this is just sheer curiosity. Be curious about this because in five or 10 or 15 years, it's gonna be something you're gonna come back to. But there is, sorry. Right. So now you know the, the how, and now you have this thing, uric acid, you're gonna measure. And now, how do we get here? What's the problem with uric acid? Well, uric acid is obviously connected with gout, but when you go higher than 
the gout levels, which are the sixes and sevens and so on, where crystals start to form in your joints, you get into things that are what they call comorbidities, associated conditions, associating conditions like obesity, diabetes, dementia, Alzheimer's even back that way, uh, cardiovascular disease, and then of course, cerebrovascular, which simply means blood vessels in your brain, ends up being a big deal. And even you can go into osteoporosis, but it's not so black and white there. A little more complicated, so we can't sort of say, hey, it's directly associated with osteoporosis. Therefore, pay attention. Pay attention anyway. All right, so now we got that, and it comes down to, here's the controversy, here's the argument that I get on a lot of the comments that come in the videos, is like, ear ca uh, gout has been documented for, what, 5,000 years? Back in Egypt. So what did they eat in Egypt 5,000 years ago? To give us a little context around that first documented case of gout, aka elevated uric acid. All right, so what we have is about 2,000 years ago, uh, they had a diet of whole grains, plant oils, fat, bread, lentils, cottage cheese. Interesting as cottage cheese, not just cheese. Cakes, onions, meats, dates, melons, milk production, figs, ostrich eggs, almonds, peas, bears, olives, pomegranates, grapes, vegetables, honey, garlic, and other foods. The Egyptian ate a variety of grains. Barley was primarily used for making beer. That's what you see over here. Let's slide down, feel free to get, read more about this, and it is fascinating. Down about 5,000 years ago, 3,000 years before this reference, right? So this is the time of Christ, BC. This is really 3,000 years before that. So we find because 4,900 year old tomb of King Aha had three chambers and was stocked with oxen meat, water birds, cheese, dried figs, bread, and many vessels of beer and wine for the afterlife journey. So clearly alcohol was something for them. So what did they drink 5,000 years ago in ancient Egypt? Brewing dates from the beginning of civilization in ancient Egypt and alcoholic beverages were very important at the time. Egyptian brewing began even about a thousand years before where we're looking into. It's ruins of the world's oldest brewery and capable of producing up to 300 gallons per day of beer. Symbolic of this fact was that many gods were local and familial and Oresis, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, was worshipped throughout the country. Oresis was believed to be the god of the dead, of the life, of vegetable regeneration, and of wine, not of beer. And I don't know if they dis discovered uh, distilled liquors there, but they had beer and wine. Both beer and wine were deified and offered to the gods. Pretty impressive, huh? So, was alcohol really that big of a deal back then? Cellars and wine presses even had a god whose hieroglyph was a wine press. Ancient Egyptians made at least 17 different types of beer. Do you know of any brewery have 17 types of beer? Maybe now, some. Uh, and at least 24 varieties of wine. Holy smoke, this is a big deal. The most common type of beer was known as HQT, and it was the drink of common laborers. Uh, Giza pyramid builders were allotted a daily beer ration of one and a third gallons per day. Alcohol beverages were used for pleasure, of course, nutrition, medicinal, ritual, remuneration as form of pavement, and funerary purposes. The latter involved storing beverages in tombs of the deceased for their use in the afterlife. So there you go, 5,000 years ago, Eve did. All right, so what do we have back in Egypt that we still have here? Because it's still the same condition. We have alcohol, we have purines, which are basically concentrated meat products or flesh. It could be types of seafood. And I've done a number of videos on that, so I'm not gonna go into what purines are, but they're the breakdown products of DNA and RNA and so on and so forth. A lot of proteins. Okay, so we had that 5,000 years ago. We have that now. Henry VIII had it. Leonardo da Vinci had it. Um, Lawrence Olivier had it. Thomas Jefferson had it. It goes, Benjamin Franklin, of course, had it. So what did they have? They had the alcohol, they had the purines because they could afford it. It was an affluent thing to have. But what else did they have? They probably had a lot of sugar, maybe. Sugar wasn't so much in vogue in Egypt, so that's iffy on that scenario. But the story now is, wait a minute. Elevated uric acid is all about fructose. Fructose, meaning eating fruit. Fructose isn't fruit, but it's not always about just eating fruit. Fructose comes is part of sugar. It's 50% of sugar. 
fructose and glucose together make sucrose and that's sugar. Wherever you get it, that's what sugar is. All right, so fructose has always been part of sugar. Sugar has certainly been part of gout, certainly back to Henry VIII and before that, Hippocrates, when sugar was fashionable and affordable and available. But what about people that don't have sugar? They really don't have much in the way of fruits. They're people like me. I am not a fructose kind of guy. And that's not a story for me, but it is a story for most people because when you look at labs, which we'll do in future videos, and I've done in past videos, when it gets to the point that it's, you have diabetic or obesity, people have elevated glucose now. So elevated glucose, which means elevated insulin, what happens is that drives the glucose to be converted to fructose. So now you got an artificially, if you will, endogenously made fructose, and the liver has to deal with that. The liver has to break down the glucose. It was first a good thing, oh, about, um, I think it was nearly 14 million years ago, right? We we're all there, weren't we? But that's when we got the mutation that allowed us to eat more things. We started to be able to eat fruit back then. And so fructose wasn't a, a toxin. We could make it, we could detox the fructose and turn it into glucose, which is, was the fuel for our body, still is the fuel for our body. But um, what has happened in that is that when people now have a little fructose from either they're eating fruit, which is really not that much for most fruits, and there's exceptions, of course, and they're bringing in, they have sugar in their diet, processed foods a lot, they now have a lot of fructose, fructose that comes in directly and fructose that the body is trying to get down the glucose. And they get to a point that the insulin, which gets down the glucose, isn't working anymore. So they call that hyperinsulinemia or glucose uh, intolerance, glucose, uh, glucose, sorry, well it is, um, insulin resistance. and so things aren't working. So now the glucose still has to be gotten rid of. It gets converted into fructose. Converted into fructose. So now you got this fructose source and you have the fructose that we're eating. And when you have that combination, that cranks up your uric acid. And guess what? Uric acid now fast forward the conversion of glucose to fructose. So now that whole fructose story or hyperinsulinemia or hyper it would be hyperglucose, but it will be eventually when you lose control of the insulin. The insulin can't control the glucose anymore. That is a story. But there's a lot of people that I talk to that are call them carnivores or ketovores. They're primarily meat, flesh eating people, right? Like myself. We obviously have a garden, so it's mostly spices and so on. But it's mostly meat that we eat meat, fish, chicken, poultry, whatever else we can get our hands on, kind of thing. Okay, so fructose is not part of that story. We don't have sugar in our diet, nor have we had it probably for a decade or so. So that had nothing to do with me and people like me, and I've actually had elevated uric acid. Hmm, so why is that? Well, you have to look at the big categories. One category clearly is about purines. It's about having a lot. So when I voluntarily went into a diet, went into a diet that had more you, uh, purines, that that was something I had to be careful about. What are the other things? Alcohol is another thing. So my point of this sort of talk is that there's some big obvious things you need to address. Purines, fructose, if that's your particular kind of lifestyle. Uh, alcohol for sure. Some people are more sensitive to it than others. I've covered that in other videos. But those are the big top three. So what do you do about it? What are things that you can do that are kind of make common sense and have kind of existed, call it for a million years. That would be your fish oils to make sure you have a really good omega-3 to 6 ratio, right? So that would be ideally one to one, a two to one, that's three to six. And you can get a lab test for that too and the same thing. And a lot of people have. Okay, what else can you do? You can do vitamin C. Vitamin C encourages the excretion, if you will, of uric acid. So that's a good thing. Vitamin C has always been around. Huh. It's about fruit, by the way, too, isn't it? So when you start there, and then that's kind of the basis of it. Certain special things you have to look, look for that are a problem, potentially, 
are what they call the alcohol sugars. Alcohol sugars, sorbitol. There's actually a pathway in the body called the sorbitol pathway or called the polyol pathway. Who cares? But the problem is, it's that pathway that takes glucose and sends it off to fructose. And guess what? There's certain parts of the body that can only do a couple steps and then stops. It stops at sorbitol and sorbitol gets to be bigger and bigger and bigger. That happens in your lens and your retina, happens in your kidney, it happens in your nerve cells, your Schwann cells. So that's a problem. That's, that's why diabetics get nerve problems. They get diabetic retinopathy. They get uh, diabetic nephritis. Those are the reasons they're pushing that pathway too much. This is what I need you to know about. It's not that difficult, but this is what happens when your glucose Glucose gets continually continually high and you can't bring it down. It could be a long spike for a while. It could be you're chronically high. It could be you're diabetic. This is what sets all those nasty wheels in motion, all those other conditions of elevated, chronically elevated uric acid and all the things that are associated with that, like dementia, like Alzheimer's, like cardiovascular, cerebrovascular diseases, all those things, and certainly gout, which is easy one to point to. But this is what happens that I want you to know about, okay? Glucose gets shuttled off. Is like, we got too much glucose. The body's trying to get rid of it, right? They've tried it with insulin, and insulin isn't doing its job anymore. So now they go, plan B is shuttling it off to turn it back into fructose. We evolved to use fructose to glucose back in the good old days of 14 million years ago. Now, it's just the opposite. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of the glucose. Put it into fructose. Okay, we put it into fructose in most of our body, and what happens there? The story that you already know, the liver converts it into fat, and so at least it's out of the bloodstream, but now it's fat. And it's usually the beginning stages of fatty liver and all these things. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is where that starts from. But at least the glucose is out of the bloodstream, and so that is taken care of. But guess what? It's not that clear. The whole body can't do that plan B. The whole body has a problem. So glucose can be shuttled out of the bloodstream, and changed into a thing called sorbitol. You've heard of sorbitol as a sweetener. Yeah, you'll be thinking twice now about that. So it gets turned into sorbitol, and sorbitol is like a halfway step. It's supposed to be then changed into fructose. But guess what? It doesn't happen in your lenses of your eye. It doesn't happen in your retina of your eye. It doesn't happen in your nerve cells, called your Schwann cells. And it doesn't happen in your kidneys. So what happens? Well, the glucose does go to sorbitol, and the sorbitol gets to be more and more and more and more, and now there's a sorbitol problem. What do you do with the sorbitol problem? That's a problem. That starts to cause a lot of other problems, such as diabetic retinopathy, and you don't have to be a diabetic to, be, to get this. Retinopathy, you get cataracts in your lenses. How many people do you know have cataracts? It has uh, kidney disease, nephropathy, and you have neuropathy, which is basically the dying of nerve cells. That's the plan B. Doesn't work very well if you ask me, but I wanted you to know what this is. When you, this happens when you have blood glucose levels that you can't keep down. It's called the polyol or sorbitol pathway. Easy to remember. It should be going glucose, sorbitol, fructose in the liver, into fat cells, put them wherever on the body. But if it can't happen in those parts of the body that I just mentioned, we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. So what happens is the polyol pathway, you get decreased oxide synthesis, which means you now have your blood vessels constrict. So they call that vasoconstriction. Your blood pressure goes up. You have vascular, vascular impairment in a number of places, the retinopathy, the neuropathy, the nep nephropathy, kidney. The sorbitol goes up. That the sorbitol getting bigger and bigger and bigger, that's osmotic, osmotic pressure that's killing all the nearby parts of the eye, the lenses of the kidney and the nerves. Fructose goes up. You would have thought that would have been a good thing. It's not. We can't convert that much glucose as we've talked before. Glycation, your muscles start to get sugar-coated and other parts of your body start to get sugar-coated. And this is the beginning of a very serious stage, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, reactive oxidative species, called it oxida oxidative stress. Okay, where does all this come from? High fructose corn syrup? Call it sucrose, really. 
Where does that come from? You know and I know. Whether it's Doritos or the soft drinks you have or the Oreos or the ketchup, it's all over the place. Sucrose is glucose and fructose, you know that. So now we put that together, this is what happens. Glucose, when you're having high fructose and high fructose sucrose period, it goes into this pathway and it's doubly bad. It adds fructose and it adds glucose, oh my gosh. And so in the parts of the body that can actually do this, it will make fats in the liver cells. So the liver can do this, but not those other places. So you're gonna have problems. So the backup plan to lower glucose that often makes things worse. In fact, it makes them toxic in your lens for cataracts, in your retina for retinopathy. It means you're gonna to start to go blind and in your kidneys, stop, so that's where you get kidney disease, and in your nerve cells, neuropathy. The tissues cannot convert glucose to fructose. Another illustration, it's supposed to go from, in mammals, glucose to fructose. Great, a little bit, we can use it. 14 years ago, it was a big win to make that mutation happen. Now, it's not so much a win. Here's what happens before, we talked about when you have too much fructose, the liver can't process that much. It just makes fat. So that's why fructose goes to fat. A little fructose, if we're starving, will go to sugar and thank goodness. But we quickly trump that card. We quickly exceed that capacity and we make uric acid. Fructose raises uric acid. This has been known since the 60s. So this isn't headline news. This is just now making it to the public. Examples of foods. So if you just have a fruit and you measure your uric acid. That's why I'm all about measuring uric acid. Monitor yourself, know who you are, know what your levels are. This is not a problem for everybody. This is not saying bad fruit, don't have fruit. This is saying, where are your levels? And this may be a variable that you need to address. So basically the fructose part of fresh fruit, 10%, dried fruit, 40%, table sugar, right? The glucose, fructose, 50%. And corn syrup, 55%. All right, plan B doesn't work in some parts of the body. These specific tissues can't convert sorbitol to fructose, as I've told you about. It's supposed to go glucose, sorbitol, fructose, boom, and we're done. But it gets blocked. We have the what they call osmotic damage, and it makes four cataracts, blindness, retinopathy, neuropathy, and kidney disease. So the effects of the polyol pathway activated by persistent high glucose and you're saying, well, I don't, I don't know how to have glucose. Well, let's look later. We're gonna look at some labs. So the activation of this particular pathway or the sorbitol pathway induces a lot of sorbitol. So it's gonna make you think about maybe sorbitol is not the best sweetener. It's a sugar alcohol for sure, but maybe it's not the best sweetener to have if you have an issue with blood sugar control even though it's supposed to be, no, it doesn't increase your blood sugar. No, it doesn't increase your blood sugar. It increases your fructose and da 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 right? And it causes blindness and all these other things. Increases the fructose content, increases oxidative stress. And the consequences are retinopathy, cataracts, neuropathy, and nephropathy. The remedy is low fructose and low salt. Another inconvenient truth about hyper-elevated uric acid. High sodium increases fructose. High sodium increases fructose. Another thing that increases fructose from glucose via the polyol pathway. Fructose increases uric acid. You already knew that. Here's the studies if you wanna look those up. So do you know of any foods that are high in both sucrose, which is glucose and, fruit, and fructose, and salt? Of course you do. They're all the processed foods. Salt and sugar go together in most foods a lot. So the conclusion is, the studies suggest that simple dietary measures, such as reducing salt with or without restricting fructose, can increase mitochondrial DNA, that's a good thing, to improve the markers of oxidative stress. In other words, you can turn it around by dropping the fructose and dropping the salt. I'm not going deep into the salt aspect, just gonna tell you about it, but there's a study if you wanna read about it. This is the goal. So who cares about this really anyway? This can't be you, right? You're not diabetic. You're not elevated glucose, are you? You're not elevated uric acid, are you? Do you know that? Or can it? Let's look at some labs of people who didn't think it was them either. So I took about 20 people, put them on a spreadsheet, and said, hmm, what I did is I sorted it from left to right merely according to glucose levels, okay? merely according to glucose levels. So here's the lowest of these 20 that I pulled out of a pile of people that I've, I've seen, clients. 
So from 70 to 201, yeah, that's high. So what I did is I separated them out of who's insulin resistant and who is not insulin resistant. And this is how we calculate that in the bottom. It's HOMA IR. It's basically you put in fasting insulin levels and fasting glucose levels. You also can define it by triglycerides over HDL levels. So that comes from your lipid panel. And that's another way of doing it. So the, these are all insulin resistance by HOMA IR. These are all but one insulin resistant by the triglyceride over HDL. And there's their insulin level. There's their glucose level hemoglobin 1AC, and a few other things. I want to show you these people that are insulin resistant that have elevated fasting glucose. These people definitely have activated that sorbitol pathway. These people are definitely getting more blind gradually. They're getting more cataracts gradually. They're having reduced kidney function gradually. They are getting probably, they're probably all hypertensive. They probably all have some sort of neurological condition. You know, they're losing, maybe it's a tingling, maybe it's a, a number of things. But these are those. None of them thought they had an issue. They just thought they wanted to lose some weight in this particular uh, group, as I remember, I haven't coded up above. And so when you go through this, you look at, hmm, they think everything's just fine. They need to lose the extra weight. No doubt. Look at the insulin levels. It is tremendous. This person down here, obviously the worst of this particular grab bag of people has, and yes, yeah, he's clearly insulin resistant by HOMA IR, clearly insulin resistance by triglyceride over HDL. But look at his insulin, 52. You want five and under to be healthy. The range, when you look over here, which is stupid, uh, it says normal conventional range is really about 20. I put five as ideal. So, so as we go down, we're still dealing with pretty high insulin for nearly everybody, except maybe this guy is a little out of my range, but still not too bad, this guy or woman, um, and another one over here. So this is applicable to people. It's not that esoteric. These people have a problem with the polyol sorbitol pathway, and they're looking, they're probably having these alcohol sugars thinking that it doesn't spike their glucose. Yeah, well, it has a lot of other problems for them. What else can we look at? Um, what is interesting to notice, I put the cholesterol, total cholesterol up here, you find the worst people in terms of insulin resistance have the lowest total uh, cholesterol. The healthiest people in this particular group have basically the highest total cholesterol. That's interesting. What I want to say is this does affect everybody and it is something you need to be aware of. If you're this person, man or woman down here, well then they're good. They don't need to pay attention. Maybe they had no issues at all. But to understand where you are now and every so often check in on it. If it is high, there's things you can do. To summarize, start with the, identify what your levels are. Get to know that. Look at the big things in your life. Don't get too esoteric. So is it the alcohol? Is it the purines? Is it the fructose and processed foods and the sucrose? Those are your top three. When you back down from there, things like xylitol, which is a um, sugar alcohol, and certainly sorbitol, sugar alcohol, um, those are things you need. If, you, if, if your levels are high and if this is a problem, address those. If it's not, lucky you, it's not a problem. Other things, if you have, if you're a liver lover like me, I love it. I can have too much, that's vitamin A. Too much vitamin A clearly is gonna crank up my uric acid. So I wanted to give you sort of a, a conversational list of what to do and not make it so complicated. Measure it, acknowledge what your lifestyle is in terms of diet, then address those things and then measure again and let that take a couple months to change. Till next time. So, if this is something that you're interested in, that is a topic that I obviously go deeper in, in terms of labs, in terms of how to do it, in terms of why you would want to do it, various topics, as you've seen that I've done in the past, then please let me know below in a comment. Till then.